Well, this is the week that our nation observes Martin Luther King Day, a national holiday created to celebrate the life and work of one person who led the way and gave his life seeking to change our country and the world for the better. It's also an opportunity to celebrate the lives of the many thousands of people who did that with him, struggling through more difficult times than we see even now to bring about change. And I think it's helpful for us to consider the words and the work of this modern prophet as we continue to seek to understand our own calling in this day and this time. Now, as, as Cara mentioned to the kids, I really love getting a chance to remind people that this week as our nation celebrates the life of an activist, they are celebrating the life of a Baptist minister. <laughs> Martin Luther King is known around the world as a civil rights leader and an activist, a public speaker, but before all of that, he was a Baptist pastor. And he grew up in a family of ministers, and the church was always a central part of his life and his work. And Martin Luther King Jr. believed that we live in a moral universe, one that was created by a just and loving God, but he recognized that justice doesn't occur in our human existence without the concerted and persistent cooperation of God's people. He came to this understanding through many years of study, of prayer, of seeking the scriptures. And one of those influential scriptures for Dr. King was the one that we read today from Micah. Micah was a prophet around the same time as Isaiah, and he was concerned about the injustice of his day and his time. He watched those who had the power taking advantage of those who were underprivileged. His prophetic message was that God was discouraged by the actions of the people of Israel. And in this passage, he speaks in a scene that evokes a court of law. Israel seems to be on trial for breaking their covenant that they had made with God. And God is confronting the people of Israel for forgetting how much God has cared for them in the past, for not walking in God's ways. So God speaks in the, in the verses 3 and 5 saying, what more could I have done? I cared for you, I protected you, I delivered you from slavery in Egypt, I gave you leaders. Don't you even remember during the Exodus, I protected you and I will do so again. And then as we read, Israel is pleading their case. So what can we do to make amends for our infidelity? Will you be pleased with sacrifices, with burnt offerings that leave nothing behind? Maybe the offering of the calves are most valuable animals. We can give you the oil that we need for our lamps and for cleansing. Should we sacrifice our eldest sons as the people of Canaan do? But Micah speaks the words of response from God. No. God requires conversion of heart and attitude and action. He has told you what is good. What God requires is to do justice and to love kindness and to walk humbly in relationship with God. Now the Reverend James Howell points out that this word required is significant. We tend to think of it in terms of grading or setting rules like the teacher requires you to turn in a three-page paper by Friday. That's a requirement. But this word speaks more of affection. It's more like saying a child requires its mother's love. A flower requires rain and sunshine to flourish. The Lord requires justice and kindness and mercy, not insisting or demanding it, but seeking it and yearning for it. This is what God wishes and wants and calls us to as intimate partners in God's adventure on earth. Justice being more than just simple fairness or rewarding good and punishing evil. 
This justice is everyone having what they need. The just society is one that lifts up the neediest, and God is inviting all of us to be partners in building deeper, caring, compassionate community. And then this passage, this message, this is what Jesus claims as his message. And we turn to the story that we read from Luke when Jesus has begun ministry, come back to Nazareth. Word's gotten out that he was teaching and healing. He's invited to come speak at his local synagogue. He comes for the Sabbath service. He opens up a scroll of Isaiah where it is written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me and has anointed me to bring good news to the poor, has sent me to proclaim release to the captives, recovery of sight to the blind, to let the oppressed go free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. You can feel some anticipation in the room as he hands back the scroll and everyone waits and watches for what he will say next. And he says, today this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. What is the vision that we hear from Jesus the first time he speaks to the people? A description of his purpose. A description of understanding what is this kingdom of God really like? All summarized in this one quote from Isaiah. To bring good news to the poor, to proclaim release to the captives, recovery to the blind, to set the oppressed free. Like the prophets before him, Jesus intends to take the message of God into places where God is thought not to be. In prison, with the poor and the infirm, for in that time everyone assumed that they deserved their lot in life. Sadly, that expectation is not left us in this time. People believe that someone is poor or someone has problems. It is all of their own doing. But this vision suggests that God is at work beyond the socially accepted boundaries. These are the places Jesus intends to go. And MLK Jr. in his letter from the Birmingham jail sounds much like Jesus and the prophets. He writes, I am in Birmingham because injustice is here. Just as the prophets of the 8th century left their villages and carried their thus saith the Lord far beyond the boundaries of their hometowns. Just as the apostle Paul left his village of Tarsus and carried the gospel of Jesus Christ to the far corners of the world. So I am compelled to carry this gospel of freedom from my hometown Like Paul, I must respond constantly to that Macedonian call for aid. In all that he did, Martin Luther King was seeking to live out the covenant relationship with God by following the path of Jesus. And the words of Dr. King fit and fulfill the words of Jesus that we find in the Sermon on the Mount. Blessed are the merciful, for they will receive mercy. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called the children of God. Dr. King imagined a fabric of interdependence in which each of us recognizes that his or her well-being depends on the health and the success of the neighbor and the stranger. We're all in this together. And other people's children matter, and their education is priority, and other people's health matters, and others' opportunities to live the dreams that God has given them should be a part of our dream. As Dr. King continues this letter, he writes, I am cognizant of the interrelatedness of all communities and states, I cannot sit by idly in Atlanta and not be concerned about what happens in Birmingham. Injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. 
and we are caught in an inescapable network of mutuality tied in a single garment of destiny. Whatever affects one directly affects all indirectly. I think that's my favorite quote from Dr. King. We are caught in an inescapable network of mutuality, tied in a single garment of destiny. Whatever affects one directly affects all indirectly. Dr. William Loder agrees with King's thought when he suggests that we move towards seeing God's interests and our interests and the best interests as one. When we get truly in touch with God's being as love, and when we see that this is not a distraction from life, but to be truly in touch with life and the giver of life. When we see this, then we will dig in and we will dive in. Let us be great in love. And then Martin Luther King reminds us that when I speak of love, I am not speaking of some sentimental, weak response. I am speaking of that force which all of the great religions have seen as the supreme unifying principle of life. For love is somehow that key that unlocks the door which leads to the ultimate reality. Love is creative and redemptive, and it builds up, and it unites. Hate tears down and destroys, and the aftermath of the fight with fire method is always bitterness and chaos. The aftermath of the method of love is reconciliation and creation of beloved community. Physical force can repress and restrain and coerce and destroy but it cannot create and organize anything permanent, for only love can do that. What does the Lord require of you but to do justice and to love kindness and to walk humbly with your God? Is this our goal? Does it describe who we are seeking to be? I have to say this morning when I got up, the very first Facebook post that popped up was one that said, um, if you're going to quote Dr. Martin Luther King today and you are not actively working against injustice or fighting against white supremacy, um, let us know we can help you with that. It made me a little bit nervous, except that I know that we do care and we are acting. And then we are called again each year to ask ourselves, can we do more? Where are places that we can be even more involved in actively seeking justice? Now, an interesting thought um, about Dr. King. Kayla McClung writes, When I was reflecting on the life and the witness of Martin Luther King Jr., the one thing that struck me as obvious is that he didn't start out to be who he ended up being. He didn't set out to be a visionary leader intent on making an impact in the country or the culture of his day. But he allowed himself to be created. Slowly, layer by layer, choice by choice, he became himself. He didn't choose leader of a mass civil rights movement from a list of vocational options. Anybody checking that off on your list as you decide what you're going to be? It wasn't on his list. But this identity emerged gradually from within as he yielded to the guidance of community, as he listened and he prayed and he read and he participated and he took the risks of creativity, those risks that were uniquely his own in his time. So maybe, maybe underneath who we think we are or who people expect us to be, maybe there are yet undiscovered aspects of our true identity, layers waiting to be uncovered. Martin Luther King Jr. was a minister 
in a local church, a husband and a father. He was a preacher. All of these things were such a good fit for him. He wasn't seeking and searching for a new identity. But he found himself drawn in, interested in writings that were about civil disobedience and Gandhi's thoughts on nonviolence. He became interested in folks who were questioning at that point in time the color barriers in their towns, people who were beginning to devise ways to stand up. And he came with questions, and he followed the questions, exploring the hints that came layer by layer, thus becoming more of himself, more of the person that he was called to be. King knew he had a calling to be a preacher and a father and a citizen, but what he discovered little by little was that these dreams would be fulfilled in ways he couldn't imagine. And that asks us, what about us? Are we still becoming ourselves? Are your deepest callings still unfolding in your life in ways that may be beyond what you can imagine right now? And are we as a community of faith still becoming who we are called to be. I am grateful for the opportunity each year to look again at someone who has led the way. And as we hear on the news, the many ways that there is so much more work to do to bring us closer to the justice of God's kingdom. Let us hear these words of the leaders that went before us and the words of the scripture that drove them into the directions they took. And may we have open hearts to hear where God is calling us to serve and seek justice and love kindness and to walk with our God each day.